Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, produced by City Current and brought to you by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now here's our host, the CEO of City Current, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, produced by City Current and powered by Higginbotham. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. The fun treat of this is diving into those who are making a difference and changing the world for the better indeed, powering the good. And we're honored to have with us Dr. Elizabeth Brands. She is the president and CEO of the Morris Foundation, based in Fort Worth, Texas, and Tarrant County. How are you doing, Elizabeth? Thank you, Jeremy. What a great introduction. And I'm happy to be associated, thrilled actually to be associated with a organization that has so many positive, affirming ways of introducing themselves. I hope I can live up to changing the world, change makers, all those things that you said. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, you are doing a tremendous amount, especially when it comes to the world of education and now lifting the community in a lot of different areas. And so we'll talk all about that with the Morris Foundation, but let's start with a little bit of your backstory. Give us a little bit in terms of just where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Well, thanks. My, um, we can go all the way back to Portland, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest. And I think the saying is I, I got to Texas as fast as I could, made a few stops along the way. Uh, but ended up in Fort Worth in 2017. And I have spent my career really in education. I started my career as a classroom teacher, teaching fifth grade in West Tulsa in Oklahoma. And I have lots of stories about that experience, getting off a plane, having grown up in the Pacific Northwest in, in the city of Tulsa. But really that experience was quite formative. While I, I wanted to graduate from college and change the world by writing speeches for politicians. That's what I left college wanting to do. It was really my classroom experience and my two years of of an education service program that really showed me that education is where I wanted to devote my career. I can think of a couple of students in particular that really showed me the power of education as being a great equalizer for kids that are born at no fault of their own with lots of barriers stacked against them. And um, that experience set me on a pursuit to make sure that I was creating more stories like those fifth graders in my classroom who you know, were able to overcome the barriers that life presented them and to go on and lead very prosperous lives. Um, so from my classroom teaching experience, I spent some time in, in school administration, before moving over to the philanthropy side, getting a doctoral degree in in school administration, supervision, curriculum, um, and then running an education nonprofit in Oklahoma. And again, then got to Texas as fast as I could. Were either of your parents educators or was there an educator in your childhood who made a profound difference on you that kind of planted that seed? Yeah, I guess I'd have to go all the way back to my my grandma, Mary. She was a teacher in Portland Public Schools for, for many, many years. Um, and she certainly brought home into our family stories about the classroom, the students that she taught, uh, and always had a huge place in her heart for kids and education. But, you know, I really do have to give a lot of credit to those those fifth graders in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They will They will never know, um, or or maybe now with this podcast, they will know the impact that they had on me, the transformative impact that they had on me. And and really, again, kind of in their 10, 11-year-old bodies showed me that this is where I wanted to devote my career. You know, I, I believe that as leaders in the communities that we serve in, we have a responsibility to do all that we can to reduce or eliminate barriers that kids, adults, at no fault of their own, have been stacked against them. And um, and that is really kind of what has motivated my career is a sense of responsibility that, that I have as a leader in this community to make sure that all children are afforded that opportunity to see for them the prosperous future that they want. One of your areas of kind of diving in deep was reading and is still reading. Mm -hmm. And so between reading partners and your efforts around literacy, talk about why that's so important and why you focus your efforts there. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's nothing more fundamental than being able to read, whether it's reading a driver's license application signed on the road to, you know, a job application interview. Um, there, there's nothing more foundational than being able to read and that snowball effect that it has on not just future academic success, but also future life, prosperity and attainment. Um, you know, I can I can go through the, the stats about kids who aren't able to read on grade level by third grade and how much more likely they are to not graduate high school or end up incarcerated. You know, there's even been economic analysis done that they earn, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars less for the communities that they that they live in um, and become kind of, again, that that drain on the economic strength of counties, neighborhoods, communities. Um, But I also would be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, reading opens up worlds to kids that are not afforded them in their own neighborhoods and backyards. And, you know, I think about the books that we read in that fifth grade classroom. And then as I went on to be a middle school language arts teacher, and it opens up for kids worlds that they didn't know existed and inspires them to think about a life that may be different than what they see on a day to day basis. And that kind of stuff, that kind of world, that literature and that love of reading that opens up for kids can be transformational in terms of what they aspire to do and be and dream. We have to acknowledge, too, that kids can only dream and aspire to more than what is in their own families if they have the privilege of not being able to struggle on a daily basis to have their basic and psychological needs met. And I think this is where, you know, my my commitment and determination um, from the Morris Foundation and our values of being centered around education, healthcare, and social services really intersect with what my career experience has been, which is which is more squarely in that education space. You know, when I when I was a fifth grade teacher, uh, I will never forget this young boy who came into the school one day and he took a desk and he flipped it upside down. And with the other 25 kids in that classroom and myself, the first reaction is fear, fear for the safety of yourself, for the kids. And an emotional outburst like that, it, it's, it's unpredictable. It's hard to know where that's coming from. But, what, but as we unpacked the situation, got the room back under control, you know, uh, later in the day, I found out that this young boy was going to go home and his dad wasn't going to be at home anymore because he was going to be incarcerated. And so, you know, as a 10 year old little kid, he didn't know how else to process those emotions. And he flipped the desk. Now, I would be hard pressed to say that he or anybody else in that classroom learned anything that day. I know I was not my best self as a teacher for the remainder of the day, you know, nor nor did he or any of those other kids learn much. And this example to me is one example of hundreds of thousands of examples that happen on a daily basis in classrooms across our nation that show us the intersection of education, healthcare, and social services that we must understand and be empathetic to the lived experiences of these kids. We must be respectful of the lived experiences of these kids by acknowledging that systems outside of our classrooms impact the success of what happens in schools. And so as the Morris Foundation has really committed to giving in the sectors of education, healthcare, and social services, we are leading with an example that we have to make sure that we're bridging those systems because the success of one is interdependent upon the success of another. We will never be able to achieve the aspirations that I have for literacy achievement across our county if we don't also make sure that the strength of our healthcare and social service system are working in tandem Um, Because again, if kids show up into classrooms without their basic and psychological needs being met, we cannot expect them to learn. And for any adult who's ever rolled their eyes or, or paused and wondering about what I mean by this, I turn to them and I say, you are a full grown human being. Have you ever had a day where you're hungry? You know, lunch was a little bit late, a meeting ran long, et cetera. Like, are you your best self? Now put that in the body of a seven, eight, nine, 10 year old little kid. And there's no way that we can expect them to accomplish what we want them academically if they're coming to school hungry, 
tired, frustrated. And so we really are determined to think about how we can do a better job of being empathetic and responsive and respectful of how these li- how lives are lived in our community and creating more bridges between these systems that are really end up being a win, 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 a win for kids, a win for families, a win for our community. And all of this is what you wrote about in your doctoral thesis too, correct? This was a big part of what you studied even on that end. And now you're putting it into practice and play. Is that correct? Yeah, my thesis, man, you might be like one of two people, myself included, who uh, is even familiar with what I wrote in that. But yes, that is true. I wrote about how we can implement programs and interventions into schools and how it is necessitates us having enabling structures in those schools where those programs and interventions can be implemented with some local autonomy and understanding of, of the local context, whether that's within a district or a school. And also key in that was the research around when new things come into schools or districts, the perception of who is bringing that intervention or that program matters. So is it perceived as coming from the superintendent or is it perceived as coming from the principal? And those who are implementing that program, the perception, the trust between them and the implementer is is really critical to to the success of those things. So that's what, yeah, that's right. Give me one more thing from your findings that you think is just kind of an interesting, like that. I mean, I think that's interesting too, just on the trust, the factor, like who's positioning it and and wants it and and where's it coming from, that that makes a difference, the reputation side of this. What else? Give me one other thing that you think is kind of an interesting either aha moment or something that you put into play from the thesis. Yeah, well, I think, you know, there is absolutely a perception in our public education system that it's very bureaucratic and that things are top down too often. Um, But what my, my research found was that it's okay if it's top down, as long as whomever it's coming from, whether again, it's the superintendent or principal, it doesn't necessarily matter who, it doesn't matter if it's coming from a school leader or a district leader, as long as that person is perceived as trustworthy and actually creates enabling structures to allow those people who are doing the work to do it with the local context in mind. So you could have a, well, you might think that it would be better for initiatives to come from the principal because they're more local to the school. If that principal doesn't have that layer of trust, then it may as well come from a superintendent if that superintendent is actually more trustworthy or perceived as more trustworthy within the system. So it's all about the relationship of trust and creating those structures that enable teachers to do their work, you know, with autonomy. This is Jeremy Park, CEO of City Current, personally inviting you to Growth Current. Growth Current is our e-learning and online personal development platform with City Current. It's an opportunity to attend virtual events with global thought leaders, national guest speakers, and experts who can help you grow personally and professionally. It gives you access to success secrets, lessons learned, learning modules, and so much more. Subscriptions are only $8 a month, and you can do bulk subscriptions for your team. Check out growthcurrent.co to learn more. Yeah, nice. So you've touched on the Morris Foundation. Go ahead and give some backstory in terms of 1986. Give us a little bit of history lesson for the Morris Foundation. I would love to do this. I am so inspired by our founders, Jack and Linda's story at the Morris Foundation. And I'm humbled by the role that I have to carry forth their legacy. Um, going, Going back a little further, just a couple of sentences For a couple of sentences, in 1919, my grandfather started a company in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, where the Columbia River and the Pacific Ocean intersected. He was watching fishermen struggle to catch, fillet, and clean salmon. And so he took these two tools and combined them into one so that those workers could do their jobs more effectively and efficiently. And I watched my grandfather receive the business from his father and my father received the business from my grandfather. And I certainly have a deep appreciation for how that kind of family story is ingrained in the history and legacy of a family. And so as I step in to lead this 
uh, foundation for that Jack and Linda started in, in Fort Worth in 1986. I feel the responsibility of carrying forth the history of their family in the same way that I watched my father do it as I grew up. And what I really love about Jack's story is Jack is a great example, and Linda too, of perseverance, resilience, determination, and compassion. Jack grew up in poverty. He grew up walking to school, carrying his shoes so that he could put them on when he got to school and they would be clean. And this impacted his whole life. His whole life, he had an affinity for shoes and commented on people's shoes and liked his shoes because of those early days of his life. And Jack was um, born into a family of loving parents, but they were very busy and they were hardworking. And as the story goes, when Jack showed up to school on the first day of school, unlike now when kids come to school and the teachers will have the roster that even has the child's picture, you know, that of course didn't exist back in the 1920s and 30s. And so when Jack showed up in that classroom, the teacher took the names of all the kids and asked them one by one and wrote down their names to create that roster. And when the teacher got to Jack, he said that his name was Boy Morris, because the only name that he had ever been given was the name on the bracelet when he was born in the hospital that identified his gender and last name. And the teacher said, I can't call you boy. And so he named himself Jack and he kept as his middle initial always. And we use it today, the initial B to remember where he came from. And those stories I think are so poignant because they show where Jack started and what he built. And he built a career and a life and a family that enabled him and Linda to make the decision with their estate that they would leave it to give back to Fort Worth, the community that raised them, that provided this path that he could see of of prosperity, that that was attainable for him to, to give it back to that community that was so good to him. A couple other quick stories about Jack, if I may, you know, he, while, while you might think, while it might, and it, while it may be easy to think that the people make their money or become wealthy in Texas because of oil and gas and, and maybe ranching back in the day when that was more profitable than it is today, you know, Jack's story was not one of making money through oil and gas. He, again, through perseverance and determination, had a number of businesses. They succeeded. Some of them them failed. And he got back up again and restarted. And what he was most known for and then ended up selling, which became kind of a big piece of, of the estate and the foundation, was the company that he had developed about over 90 patents to make carpet padding. So he had developed the technology that moved the carpet padding industry from the previous jute technology to more what we know of it today. And every time when I drive on the freeway and I see trucks with carpet pad in the back, it always seems like they stick out over the back of the truck. So I usually change lanes just in case it's going to fall out the back of the truck. But I remember Jack. And it's such a powerful example to me that something that we might not think of as being able to build a career off of, we stand on it every day. You know, it almost becomes ubiquitous with with life and living and et cetera, that this is what he made his, his life around and built his family around and built his companies around. And I think it's such a powerful example to say there's lots of ways, there's lots of roads to prosperity. And this is how Jack made it. And so, you know, we, we are humbled by those stories of where Jack came from, what drove and motivated him and try to live out those core values in the things that we do um, all across the foundation today. You've also alluded to the three areas that you focus on education, healthcare, social services, Mm -hmm. talk about the mission and the driving force behind the foundation. So, you know, our vision going forward is to do more to bridge those systems. Again, this is a response to um, empathy for the lived experiences of those that Jack and Linda wanted to come alongside when they set up the foundation and being respectful and responsive to that. It's also driven by, again, as, as all things are at the Morris Foundation, by the stories of our founders. And Jack's daughter, Michelle, will tell this story better than I will, but, but I'll try to do it justice. 
She was an only child at the time living in Fort Worth with her parents and her dad, Jack, came home one day with another family. And he said, this family is going to live with us. It was, you know, parents, a couple of kids, um, like boy, boy kids in particular. And Michelle tells this story about how the boys came into the house. They were destroying her dolls. She was an only child. She's like, what is going on? I like being an only child. Um, and, and Jack, over time, he, he gave that family shelter. He gave them food. The kids went to school. And Jack gave that father a job driving trucks for his company. And under the roof of Jack's house in his own home with his daughter and wife, he gave that family the same three things that the Morris Foundation funds today, education, health care, and social services. And he did that on the scale of one family under his, under his own roof. And we aspire to do that now with the foundation that he set up for hundreds of thousands of families across our county. So when Jack did that in his home, he didn't yet know that he would leave behind the Morris Foundation. But that story is really inspiring to us to say it was always core to who Jack was to bridge these systems. It was natural to him to bring this family into his home and to give them education, healthcare, and social services. And so we we want to continue to do that. And we think Jack would be very, very proud to think that his foundation that he set up could do for hundreds of thousands of families what he did for that one family under his roof. And it's important, as you mentioned at the onset too, that you are taking a holistic approach to breaking down these barriers, supporting the whole system and doing it within, especially the schools and for the youth and the families. And so when you talk about your education as a teacher and your focus in your career as a teacher and how that kind of parlays over, all of those things that we talked about at the onset of supporting youth holistically carries forward into everything you're doing with the Morris Foundation. Last year, you supported over 100 different nonprofits, 100 different organizations. And so when you look at kind of the, the broad approach, but also the very specific of is it creating impact? Is there an ROI? Are we breaking down those, those barriers and creating a holistic approach? Talk about kind of the give and pull of being strategic and yet also too looking at the broad range of how do we make a difference? Oh yeah. Well, I, I am, I am not so naive to think that what we are, uh, our vision isn't, isn't um, a big audacious goal, but it is, it is this, just that it is a big audacious goal. Um, you know, these systems that we're talking about, education, healthcare, social services, any one system on its own is a, is a mammoth of a, of a system. And we get that. We understand that. We're not naive to that. Um, so we are eyes wide open in terms of the ambitious, you know, big audacious goal that we are, that we are setting for ourselves. But that's okay. You have to, you know, dream big, aspire big, you know, if we're going to uh, see kind of the, the change that we want to see happen. And we balance that constantly with then, you know, what are the smaller bites of the apple that we can take today that have immediate impact. So things like um, funding food pantries, food uh, banks, you know, we continue to do that knowing that one day we all hope to put all the food banks out of business you know, um, and again, a, a big audacious goal that I am not so naive to understand is, is a long way down the road, but balancing both of those things of how are you creating, you know, improvements in the system while addressing the more immediate needs, you know, and I guess too, I'll, I'll say that if it was easy, it would already be done. Right. And, and so what we, I think the best that we can hope for is that over time, we will poke holes in the system. And as we poke holes in the system and create small opportunities to bring these systems more in continuity with each other, bring creating a big enough table where everybody sees that there's a spot for them at that table that provides additive value for the common and shared goals that we have as a community, that over time we will create improvements. I, I guess I'm going to uh, say it publicly with, for everybody who's listening to this right now, I just talk about it at home, but I really talk about it as my avocado project. I read that when you plant an avocado and you plant that bulb, initially it bears some flowers, but it takes years for the avocado to grow, it takes years for the avocado as we know it to grow. 
So I call this my avocado project. You know, we will see flowers today as we address kind of the immediate needs and, and we poke holes. Um, but over time, it's our vision that we will that we will have created more bridges between the systems than currently exist. So I'll give you some leeway on, you know, do you tell a flower story or the avocado mm-hmm. story? But what's a what's a recent story that puts a smile on your face that shows, hey, this is working? Oh, yeah. I think there's there's lots of things that put smiles on my face. I mean, we as a city of Fort Worth, we are very close to um, some historic impact on um, permanent supportive housing and a homeless population here in Fort Worth. Uh, great examples of combination of county, city, and philanthropy coming together to bridge some of the ARPA funding that was a result of you know, two presidents passing COVID relief dollars to local communities to say we are on the brink of being very close to saying we can solve that problem in our city. Um, Similarly, we have some great partnerships with the city and our school district to make sure that families stay in their house, in their housing, if that's where they want to be, Um, and how we share data and partnership with our school systems, where there's schools with high mobility of students, and with our city that, that can keep that can keep families in those in that housing if they want to be there to say we know that this is a win win. If kids can stay in their in their house if that's where they want to be, it creates continuity and stability. They're not changing schools, they're not changing living environments, and so those those I think are are some of the first things that come to mind. And I know I know that I could I could go on. What are some trends that have your attention that you think these are exciting? So whether it's on kind of the data side, the analytics, the tracking, or just breaking down the silos, maybe it's combining and taking an issue-based approach versus a specific nonprofit approach. What are the trends that have your attention that you think are, are good signs moving ahead? Yeah, I would say two things come to my mind immediately. One is, you know, over the last two years, we have seen a unprecedented number of challenges, but in each of those challenges, I am inspired by the Fort Worth community to rise up and see the opportunity. And we have seen leaders that have leaned in to the challenge in a way where great leaders should. I mean, I think it is inspiring when leaders stand up when things are the hardest and say, this is when I'm going to double down. This is when leadership matters and we're going to figure out how to persist. And in that too has been a great sense of collaboration. When I moved to Fort Worth, one of the things that stood out to me first was the spirit of collaboration. Fort Worth is a growing city. We are now like the 12th largest city in the country. And that is so amazing to me. It's surprising to me in some ways too, because I can still drive to work and be driving across the university and having horses going to Dickey's arena that are just walking across the street. And you would never think that when you think of kind of the 15 largest cities in, in our country. But what I love about that is the pride and the strong sense of culture and who we are as, as um, residents of Fort Worth. And I think key to that is the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of we will come together and we will solve hard things. And we've seen that all across the board from our nonprofit leaders to our civic leaders, to our elected officials, to our faith based leaders, uh, our business community that says we will stand up when things get hard and, and we and we can figure it out here. The other thing, you know, too, that I will say uh, in terms of, you know, trends that have us excited is the Morris Foundation spent some time over late last year and early into this year saying, let's pause and figure out what is working. There is an abundance of data out there uh, and probably of the Morris Foundation's three giving categories of education, healthcare, and social services, there's no shortage of education data, local, public, national, wherever you want to look, it's out there. And I think what this, this shows us is that There are things that are proven to have worked, literature reviews across countless contexts, studies, researchers have have pointed to the things that we know are most impactful for for academic success along various points in the pipeline from our earliest learners through post-secondary completion. 
Now, what we need to do is implement those things with fidelity to get that same kind of impact and outcome. And so we're inspired by that. We're inspired by the fact that we know what needs to happen. And now it's a matter of making sure that we are are implementing, we're evaluating how we're doing. We have a culture of continuous improvement. It's okay to, it's okay to meet challenges. Um, And when we meet those challenges, setting a culture, uh, we're going to figure it out, problem solve and move forward. Um, So we're, we're inspired by kind of, I think those three main trends, what we're seeing across our leadership community, collaboration, and then uh, that there's powerful data to show us what works and then how we come together to make sure we're implementing those things with fidelity. What advice would you give for others, whether it's foundations, catalysts, organizations in different communities that say, I want to create similar confluence in terms of bringing people together, breaking down barriers and pouring into these areas and and make a difference. What words of encouragement recommendations would you give them? Well, my response might um, tell a little bit about myself, but my, my response to that would be make sure to listen first, especially when you sit in the role that I do or a similar role to mine as being a leader of a foundation. We recognize that one of the primary services we provide in the community as the checks that we send to literally pay for the people and the operations to do this work. The Morris Foundation has been reflective over the past couple of years about what other resources a foundation has to bring to bear in catalyzing change, positive change in a community. But we have to be respectful of the fact that we don't implement the change. We are not the implementers of the change. And so that's where I go back to this point of listening first. So I have spent, you know, these last five, six months on a listening tour saying, here's what we see. Here's what we have invested the resource and discovery and um, analytics in identifying some missing assets. But gone are the days when we can show up in a school district's building or a leader's building and say, here's what you need to do. Those days have to be gone. And I put myself back in my shoes as a teacher and as a school leader. It is an antiquated approach for us to say that we know how to do their jobs just because one time I was also a student. And so when we go on this listening tour, we show up and we listen to their challenges and opportunities, uh, what they see as bright spots on the horizon and share with them what we're seeing as missing assets in our ecosystem to get their reaction and feedback to say, could this be beneficial to you? How could it be? If so, why? If not, why? And so I I just really would emphasize this idea of leaning into making sure that we're listening. And I have to be honest, it's, it can be hard for me because I get excited and I go and I talk to these other leaders and I'm like, let's do it. We can do it. At the end of the day, I am a doer. I am a high achiever. uh, And I'm, and I get inspired pretty easily by other leaders And I have to remind myself that we can facilitate this discovery phase. We can facilitate the convening. We can bring resources to the table like data and experts from across the country or across our nation who can provide resources to these leaders. But at the end of the day, I am not the one implementing the change in the system, whether it's the healthcare system, education system, or social service system. And so uh, my, my advice would be, make sure to go on a listening tour. Yeah, that's great advice. How can we help? How can the public help the Morris Foundation? Man, what a great question. Well, I I would say that as a society, we've gone through a a hard couple of years. There has been no person who has been spared a hardship in some way, shape, or form. So nobody has been spared hardship over the last couple of years. And what I think that we need to do more of is make sure that we're creating a more balanced narrative. While there are point places to point the finger and say, this is, this is a hard spot. We should be critical of this. We need to remember that there are also heroes in every place and space across our community. And whether it's our healthcare system or our teachers who it's been very easy to point the finger at and say, look at how they have fallen short we have to remember that there are there is heroic work happening in classrooms, not just in Fort Worth, but across our country. 
And these are the real life heroes that get up every day when the stakes are really high for kids and the pressure on them is really great. And they don't wear capes and they don't wear their underwear on the outside of their clothes, but they make the daily decision to do the hard thing and to do the right thing. And I think we absolutely, we deserve as a community, we deserve as a society to make sure that that story is coming out of our our mouths and out of our public discussion first before we move to being critical. It's too easy to be critical and it's the easy way out. Like we have to make sure that we are creating a more balanced narrative and, you know, and um, whether it's students or teachers or whomever it is, they feel this, they feel the criticism on them and it's doing no service to anybody. It's doing no service to the kids that are this generation who have gone through school in these last two years for us to be talking about how they are this lost generation that does them no service. We have to absolutely start shifting the narrative, creating at least a more balanced narrative to say there is opportunity in this generation in a way that we might not fully see yet and we're still unpacking and uncovering, but the brightest minds in our communities and in our nations are thinking about it because they deserve that. So that's what I would say, you know, not just for the Morris Foundation, but for for kids and families, for, for our country, I think we absolutely have to start our conversations with one positive thing we are seeing because they're happening everywhere and it's too easy to point to, to the thing that's critical. For you as a former teacher, what's one thing or the first one that comes to mind that you wish the community would have done to support you more heavily? So whether it's the business community, parents, in other words, what's, a, what's something we can do to support our teachers specifically on our end? You know, I think it's going to look different based on, you know, who you are. If you are a parent of a student in a school, you know, I would absolutely make sure that, you know, you are thanking your teacher. You're telling your your child, your teacher appreciates you and values you and sees the best in you. You know, if it's if it's our business community, I would be thinking about how you're reaching out. Last week was teacher appreciation week. How you're reaching out to a business in your neighborhood and saying, can I bring donuts to all the teachers? Our, our nation will now move towards, you know, end of year assessments. And that's a high stakes thing on kids and teachers. And we can argue the merits of if it's right or wrong, but the reality is it exists. Um, you know, and reach out to our schools and just say, can I bring donuts for all the teachers this week? Teachers would probably not appreciate schools bringing donuts for students during testing, but, <laughs> you know, maybe that can be the last day of school as the teachers are handing the donut to the child as they go off to summer. Uh, but as a teacher, whenever it was donut day for kids, it was like, this is too much sugar in a classroom. Um, so I think things like that, you know, at, at least as a starting point to build that relationship. And then the second thing I would do is just say, is just to ask ask the teacher, ask the principal, what do you need? How can I help? I would be remiss if I had gave a blanket answer to how you could help, you know, every teacher in every school. Uh, but I think, you know, showing up with those donuts saying, we are a partner in your neighborhood. What do you need from the business community? You know, may, may be a great place to start. What's a bit of advice that somebody gave you, a business leader, a mentor? What, what's something, either a quote or advice that they gave you that you found helpful? Um, a couple of years ago, when I was uh, leading a nonprofit, I had this picture in my office and the picture was a, a real picture taken, a photo taken, and it was an adult and a child and their backs were to you in the picture. So you was like you were standing behind them. And why that picture really resonated with me is because while absolutely there are times when leaders need to stand up and lead, and they're going to be the ones in the front of the room, I think so often leadership is standing behind others and helping them be more awesome than they even know they're capable of. And that's the kind of leader that I want to be because you can create more impact, more power when you think about all all the people that you intersect with and connect with and how you can help them be more awesome than they even thought they could be and stand behind them and lifting them up. I think that's true leadership is, is how you do that. So we're going to switch over and do a lightning round. So it's short questions and short answers. Okay. What do you like to do to relax? I love to be outside. The mountains are my favorite. 
What's a recent TV show or movie you've watched? <laughs> Ooh, I just watched the documentary about how they got those children out of the cave, um, the soc- young soccer team out of the cave. And I think that is true bravery and, and heroism. What's a recent book that you've read? I um, love any books about unlikely stories of unlikely friends. So I really like the Frederick Bachman series. You, um, people who become friends who you wouldn't expect to be and, and the, the power of that relationship. Where do you like to go to vacation? So outside of the Fort Worth area, where's a favorite vacation spot? Cannon Beach, Oregon, but don't tell anyone because I don't want it to become too popular. <laughs> when you have friends come to visit in Fort Worth, where do you like to take them? Um, I'm kind of into the zoo and the museum area district these days. Do you have any favorite restaurants or favorite uh, spots to eat? Anywhere along the Trinity River Trail, you can sit outside, see the river, watch people on the trail. So whether that's, yeah, anywhere there. What is a family tradition that you enjoy? On Christmas morning, we walk to my grandma's house for coffee and sweet rolls. So she lives close enough in our neighborhood that we are able to walk there. And over the years, sometimes it's walking. There was years where it was riding new bikes or rollerblading on new rollerblades that we would get on Christmas morning. But it was always the the family pilgrimage across the neighborhood to uh, grandma's house for cinnamon rolls and coffee. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Are you a stay up late and get things done or wake up early and get things done type of person? Definitely wake up early. I've never been a night owl. Don't, <laughs> don't talk to me after 10 p.m. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> What uh, is a favorite, and you don't have to get this exactly right, but a favorite quote or something that inspires you? Oh, yeah. I like the quote of... Um, Yeah, leadership is about standing up in moments of conflict and controversy and challenge. What is one thing that you wish everyone knew about you? (laughs) Easy icebreaker. What what do you want everyone to know? What's one thing you wish that they all knew? (laughs) One time I was bungee jumping in Costa Rica, and this is probably the first time my mom has even heard that. Nice. All right. That's cool. I like that. Good leap of faith right there. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Probably a leap of something. Leap so, of something for sure. <laughs> you are creating your legacy every single day, obviously, with what you do. But many, many, many years from now, what do you hope that people say about you and your efforts, not just with the Morris Foundation, but for you personally? Oh, man. That's a big one, right? Um. <laughs> There's a book called a kid's book. I just gave it to my niece and it's called, what would you do with an idea? And the premise of the book is that you can take an idea and you can change your corner of the world. And I hope that someday that it is said about me that I didn't change the whole world. I'm not aspiring to change the whole world, but that in some corner of the world that I intersected with, I took an idea and I changed that corner. Yeah, that's awesome. Wrap up with contact information and uh, website, social media. Where do we go to learn more about the Morris Foundation? So where can we plug in and get involved with the Morris Foundation and also follow your efforts personally? You can follow us on our website, um, morrisfoundation.org. We're a little light on the social media side right now. We're kind of moving into the 21st century there. But also I am always available, literally My door is open, whether it's physically in my office, virtual door, text, or email. I make a commitment to be responsive. I think that is one of the way that we build trust in communities and in relationship is to be responsive. Uh, And so, you know, that, that is always a great way to get to hold them, to get a hold of me too. Well, Dr. Elizabeth Brands, president and CEO of the Morris Foundation, you are a change maker indeed. Thank you for coming on the Change Makers podcast. Well, thank you, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure and I appreciate being in such good company with you and others that you have. Um, It's a high bar to live up to, but we'll see if we can make some change in our corner of the world here. 
Thank you for listening to the Changemakers podcast, produced by City Current and brought to you by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. To learn more about our guests and share your stories of others leading by example, visit us online at citycurrent.com or follow us on social media using at City Current. Please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen. Now, think big, start small, and act now. Be a change maker.